May the Lord open to him the gates of paradise, that he may return to that homeland where there is no death, where eternal joy endures. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. the Lord be with you. Well, good morning, everyone. And when we were celebrating the Feast of St. Mungo yesterday, we didn't think that God had already called the successor of Mungo as the Archbishop, as the Bishop of Glasgow, Philip Tatalia, our former Bishop, to himself. And so Monsignor and I offer this Mass for Bishop Philip, for Archbishop Philip, for a man who loved this diocese. He always said that Paisley was his first love. And as his, as his people, as his priests and his people, we knew his leadership, his affection, his concern, his preaching. And we offer to God our praise and our thanks for the life of Philip, and we intercede for him that he may be admitted to the company of the saints. Gathered as God's holy people, celebrating the mercy which was proclaimed by Archbishop Philip for so long, that mercy of God which in, on which we are all dependent, let us begin acknowledging our sin. Lord Jesus, you are the way, the truth, and the life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. You are the resurrection and the life. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You are the good shepherd leading us into everlasting life. Lord, have mercy. Lord, May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. Let us pray. O God, who chose your servant Philip from among your priests and endowed him with the pontifical dignity in the apostolic priesthood, grant, we pray, that he may also be admitted to their company forever. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Reading from the prophet Isaiah. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts <clears throat> will prepare for all people a banquet of rich food. On this mountain, he will remove the mourning veil covering all peoples and the shroud enwrapping all nations. He will destroy death forever. The Lord will wipe away the tears from every cheek. He will take away his people's shame everywhere on earth. For the Lord has said so. That day it will be said, See, this is our God, in whom we hope for salvation. The Lord is the one in whom we hope, we exult, and we rejoice that he has saved us. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord is my light and my help. The Lord is my light and my help. The Lord is my light and my help. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Before whom shall I shrink? The Lord is my light and my help. There is one thing I ask of the Lord. For this I long, to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to savor the sweetness of the Lord, to behold his temple. The Lord is my light and my help. O oh Lord, hear my voice when I call. Have mercy and answer. It is your face, O oh Lord, that I seek. Hide not your face. The Lord is my light and my help. I am sure I shall see the Lord's goodness in the land of the living. Hope in him. Hold firm and take heart. Hope in the Lord. The Lord is my light and my help. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Hope is not deceptive, because the love of God has been poured into our hearts by the Holy Spirit, which has been given us. We were still helpless when, at this appointed moment, Christ died for sinful men. It is not easy to die even for a good man, though, of course, for someone really worthy, a man might be prepared to die. But that proves that God's love that God loves us, that Christ died for us while we were still sinners. 
Having died to make us righteous, is it likely that he would now fail to save us from God's anger? When we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, we were still enemies. Now that we have been reconciled, surely we may count on being saved by the life of his Son. Not merely because we have been reconciled, but because we are filled with joyful trust in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have already gained our reconciliation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Alleluia, alleluia. It is my Father's will, says the Lord, that I should lose nothing of all that he has given me, and that I should raise it up on the last day. Alleluia. The Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord. When the sixth hour came, there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour. And at the ninth hour, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, My God, my God, why have you deserted me? When some of those who stood by heard this, they said, Listen, he is calling on Elijah. Someone ran and soaked a sponge in vinegar, and putting it on a root, gave it to him to drink, saying, Wait and see if Elijah would come to take him down. But Jesus gave a loud cry and breathed his last, and the veil of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The centurion who was standing in front of him had seen how he had died, and he said, In truth, this man was the Son of God. When the Sabbath was over, Mary of Magdala, Mary the mother of James and Salome, bought spices with which to go and anoint him. And very early in the morning on the first day of the week, they went to the tomb just as the sun was rising. They had been saying to one another, Who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance to the tomb? <coughs> but when they looked, they could see that the stone, which was very big, had already been rolled back. On entering the tomb, they saw a young man in white robe seated on the right-hand side, and they were struck with amazement. But he said to them, There is no need for alarm. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See, here is a place where they laid him. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. When I was the parish priest of Weems Bay, there were quite a number of European people who stayed there, the different language groups, because IBM had their international call centre here in Greenock at that time. And one of the people who was working in the call centre was a young man from Bavaria in Germany. And he met, he met a Scottish woman who was a dentist, but she was also the organist in West Kilbride Kirk. And so when they got married, we arranged so that the marriage could take place in West Kilbride Kirk. And I went down to it. And afterwards, at the reception in the Brisbane Hotel in Largs, I was speaking with the minister and I said to him, you know, your sermon, your homily, I said, that was one of the best homilies I've ever heard at a wedding. And it truly was about sacramentality and about the unity and indissolubility, all the things that we would think of as sound Catholic theology about the, the sacrament of marriage. And of course it was also compassionate and involving of the couple themselves. But it wasn't in any way sentimental, it wasn't extreme or, you know, it wasn't an entertainment. It was thought-provoking and profound. And he said to me, well, he said, you know, I learned sacramental theology in Glasgow University from your bishop. He said, in the four years I was there in the university, his lectures were the highlight. He says, I learned all my sacramental theology from Philip Tatalia. And that, of course, was 
Bishop Philip's first role as a teacher. He taught in seminary, and then, of course, as our bishop and as Archbishop of Glasgow, he fulfilled that office of teaching the faith, of helping people to understand. And he had a profound intellect, a piercing intellect. He could look at a problem and dissect it and describe it and say, from this perspective, that's what that means, but from the other perspective, this is what that means. I remember saying to him once, I wish that I had been taught by you. And I'm not unhappy with who to teach me because the man who taught me theology in seminary had been a student of Pope Benedict, did his doctorate in Germany under Joseph Ratzinger. But the clarity of thought and the way in which Philip was able to explain and dissect issues and just discuss them was profound. No more so in the sacraments than with the Blessed Trinity. Each year I used to say to him, can you not write a letter for Trinity Sunday that will save us having to preach? Because you know more about it than any of us, understand it better than any of us. He would just laugh. He was a teacher. In December 2014, just shortly before Christmas, a bin lorry went out of control up Queen Street and into George Square, killing many people and injuring many others. And that night I was speaking to him on the phone and by this stage of course he was the Archbishop of Glasgow and I said, oh, did, did, did the council phone and say, come up? Because he had gone with some of the priests from the office and the, the cathedrals to the city chambers where the relatives of those who had been injured and killed were gathering. And he said to me, no, I just thought because that's what people were gathering, we should go. And of course, that's a shepherd, that's a pastor. He knew there was a need and he addressed that need. And that was never really made public. What was public, of course, was his involvement in many of the funerals in the following few weeks in parts of the archdiocese, people of the archdiocese who had been killed. But he was a pastor. He had been an assistant priest for a short period in Our Lady of Lourdes in, in Cardano before he went into the seminary in the 1980s. He had been an assistant priest in Dumbarton and then for 10 years he was a parish priest in Dundalker before he returned to Rome as rector and then came home to be our bishop. And those 10 years of being a priest in the parish gave him an understanding of us as priests and of people in parishes. He was a pastor. Someone said once, tell three stories about a person and you sum him up. So I've told you two. He was a teacher, he was a pastor. But he was called to be a leader. Summoned to the congregation of the bishops when he was a the rector of the college in Rome to see the prefect one day. He was not expecting to be asked to be the Bishop of Paisley, but of course his response on being asked was to say yes. He used to joke that when he was a student in the 1970s at the Gregorian University in Rome, that when the person who was teaching him, the priest, the Jesuit, who was teaching the, the class that he was in about the theology of ordination of a bishop, he said there were two specific graces came with that ordination. One was a strengthening of the will and the other was a dimming of the intellect. In the office in Paisley, whenever, if sometimes he would say things and when Senior Gallagher or I or someone else might say, is this your will strengthening or your intellect dimming? Because neither were applicable to him as our should leader as our bishop, because he was a man of humility, a shy man in many ways, a reticent man, but he never imposed on anyone. He was not a willful person in the sense of the way in which he directed others. He led us after the heart of Christ the Good Shepherd, and for that we give thanks. 
When I was working with him in the Bishop's Conference and was responsible for the media, I said to him once, how would you like to be presented? You know, do you want us to emphasize the, the, you know, to the media, do you want us to emphasize the, your intellectual background or the, you know, your interests, the football and, you know, being a priest in parish for 10 years for all those? I don't want to be presented to anybody, he said. I just want to be myself. One day I tried to get a human interest story. He had told me years before that his broken nose, which he had, that Roman nose of his, which was off to one side, it was because that a boy who lived up the same close as him had kicked him in the face one day when they were playing football. And one day in the office I said to him, what was the name of that guy again that kicked you in the face? And he said, you just want to find him and make a story of that and give it to the papers. No, I'm not telling you. He had seen through me. Because he was a humble man. He did not want to be in the front page of the Herald or the Daily Record. He did not want to be on radio or television. He just wanted to be the Archbishop of Glasgow or the Bishop of Paisley or the Parish Priest of Dintoka. He was a humble man. A humble leader. He wrote his doctoral thesis on the theology of the Eucharist in the Council of Trent. And the Eucharist was the centre of his life. His devotion to the Eucharist, his celebration of that Eucharist. The worldly celebration of that Eucharist. And one of the Eucharistic hymns of St. Thomas Aquinas, which we used to sing in the benediction in the old days, was O Salutaris Ostia. And from that hymn, he took his Episcopal motto, which was on his coat of arms. Daro bur fer auxilium, thine aid supply, thy strength bestow. I'll finish with the second verse in English of O Sacred, O, 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 save, o Saving Victim, O Salutaris Ostia, because it mentions the Trinity and it prays that for at length of endless days in the presence of God, which is what we commend Philip to today in our Mass across this diocese, in the diocese, the Archdiocese of Glasgow, and all of Scotland. And we remember in particular his brothers and sisters, their families, the people of the Archdiocese of Glasgow and priests, and the people and priests of this diocese. To thy great name be endless praise, immortal Godhead one in three. O oh, grant us endless length of days in our true native land with thee. Amen. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the bread we offer you. Fruit of the earth and work of human hands will become for us the bread of life. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through your goodness we have received the wine we offer you. Fruit of the vine and work of human hands, it will become our spiritual drink. Pray, my brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. Accept, O Lord, we pray, the sacrificial gifts we offer for the soul of your servant, Archbishop Philip, that, as you accorded him the pontifical dignity in this world, so you may command him to be admitted to the company of your saints in the heavenly kingdom, through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and just. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God, through Christ our Lord. For he is the salvation of the world, the life of the human race, the resurrection of the dead. Through him the host of angels adores your majesty and rejoices in your presence forever. May our voices, we pray, join with theirs in one chorus of exultant praise as we acclaim, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of hosts, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You are indeed holy, O Lord, and all you have created rightly gives you praise. For through your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, by the power and working of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy, and you never cease to gather a people to yourself, so that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. Therefore, O Lord, we humbly implore you, by the same Spirit, graciously make holy these gifts we have brought to you for consecration, that they may become the body and blood of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, at whose command we celebrate these mysteries. For on the night he was betrayed, he himself took bread, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took the chalice, and giving you thanks, he said the blessing, and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it, for this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The mystery of faith. Save us, Saviour of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the saving passion of your Son, his wondrous resurrection and ascension into heaven, and as we look forward to his second coming, we offer you in thanksgiving this holy and living sacrifice. Look, we pray, upon the oblation of your Church, and recognizing the sacrificial victim by whose death you will to reconcile us to yourself, grant that we who are nourished by the body and blood of your Son and filled with his Holy Spirit may become one body, one spirit in Christ. May he make of us an eternal offering to you, so that we may obtain an inheritance with your elect, especially with the most blessed Virgin Mary, Mother of God, with blessed Joseph as far as with your blessed apostles and glorious martyrs, and with all the saints, on whose constant intercession in your presence we rely for unfailing hope. May the sacrifice of our reconciliation, we pray, O Lord, advance the peace and salvation of all the world. Be pleased to confirm in faith and charity your pilgrim church on earth, with your servant Francis, our Pope, and John, our Bishop, the Order of Bishops, all the clergy, and the entire people you gain for your own. Listen graciously to the prayers of this family who you have before you. In your compassion and merciful Father, gather to yourself all your children scattered throughout the world. Remember your servant Philip, whom you have called from this world to yourself. Grant that he who is united with your son in a death like his may also be one with him in his resurrection when from the earth he will raise up in the flesh those who have died and transform my lowly body after the pattern of his own glorious body. To our departed brothers and sisters too, to all who are pleasing to you at their passing from this life, give kind admittance to your kingdom. There we hope to enjoy forever the fullness of your glory. 
when you will wipe every tear from our eyes. For seeing you, our God, as you are, we shall be like you for all the ages and praise you without end. Through Christ our Lord, through whom you bestow in the world all that is good. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. At the Saviour's command, informed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress, as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Saviour, Jesus Christ. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant our peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And with your Lamb of God, take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, grant us peace. <clears throat> behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world, Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. This is the bread that comes down from heaven, says the Lord, so that one may eat it and not die. Let us pray. We pray, almighty and merciful God, that as you made your servant, Archbishop Philip, an ambassador for Christ on earth, so you may raise him purified by this sacrifice to be seated with Christ in heaven, who lives and reigns forever and ever. The Lord be with you. May almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Let us go in the peace of Christ. Amen.